Uh, as Steve said, I'm the sort of head of engineering CTO figure of um, Audio Squadron, which has this Prism Sound brand where we make high-end, um, high-quality audio converters and interfaces. And then on the traction side, we make a bunch of um, synthesizers and the Waveform DAW and the open source traction engine it runs on. I mainly work on traction engine when I'm coding um, and sometimes on the front end of Waveform as well. So I want to open today uh, with a quote from Titus Winters, who's a tech lead at Google. And the quote goes, Software engineering is programming integrated over time. Now, that may sound simple, but it actually draws an important distinction between programming, which is the act of writing code, and engineering, which is the process of maintaining code, delivering code, working with other people. Um, and when we think about engineering, the, the key difference here is that there's a time element involved. And today, we're going to start to look at performance and optimization as, as an engineering approach so we can kind of start to build a system to kind of inform us so we can make decisions about performance and that should hopefully help us keep a handle on it. So we're going to talk about this in roughly three different chapters. First we're going to talk about benchmarking and measurement, then some actual optimization techniques and finally how these can play into multi-threading. So as I go through this benchmarking, we're going to kind of build up the terms that we need. Um, but keep in mind that we're looking to build a system here that we can reference over time. So just keep that in your head. But back to the beginning, what are benchmarks? Well, benchmarks effectively measure code execution um, time. So how long does a piece of code take to run? Typically in benchmarks more on the micro scale, we're measuring the same piece of code over and over again so we can get um, some more details from it. And they're used to assess performance characteristics in a structured, repeatable way. That's the key thing here. And if we do this in a structured, repeatable way, it means we can look for trends. And trends help us identify regressions, so when performance gets worse. They help us measure optimization attempts, so when we're actively trying to improve performance, whether we've succeeded or not. And linked to that is so we can compare environments. Um, if you're targeting multiple operating systems or platforms, you want to make sure that if you've improved performance on one, you haven't made it significantly worse on any of the others. Next thing to look at is um, micro versus macro benchmarks. Now, this is a sliding scale, so you can sit kind of somewhere in the middle of it as well. But on one side, we have micro benchmarks, which typically measure a, a single component or task, so possibly a function or a few lines of code. And they tend to be fairly low level, which means we're often looking at instructions, cache misses, that kind of thing. And I like to think of them akin to unit tests in scope, whereas a unit test might check the correctness of a single function. Um, a micro benchmark might check the performance of a single function. On the other side, we have macro benchmarks. And these uh, typically measure a whole system or at least several components of it. So they're therefore much higher level, and we're looking at often different things such as throughput or total execution time. And again, if we kind of um, compare this to testing, we're looking more at sort of integration tests here, so many components of a system. And because they're much higher level and we're looking at lots of components, they typically reflect what our users will see a bit more. So um, in a DAW, if you're exporting a session, like rendering it down to a WAV file, um, a macro benchmark might test how long that takes. So if you um, export a session that was taking 30 seconds down to 20 seconds, that's a noticeable change that your users will see. So we want to do some benchmarking, but what information do we need out? What data do we need to uh, record? So because we're ideally measuring a piece of code executing lots of times, we can not only get the total execution time, but the minimum time that section of code took to run the max, the mean, average, and also the variance or standard deviation. And each of these tells us different things. So total execution time, as I just said, is useful for macro character characteristics. Max gives us um, the worst case scenario. So if you imagine running some performance test, um, processing some audio, and you know the uh, Sample rate of 44.1, buffer size of 512, that audio should complete in 11 milliseconds. If it's all the time taking, or even occasionally taking 15 milliseconds, you know you'll get a buffer underrun on that platform. 
And minimum is also useful because it tells us where our kind of theoretical um, minimum could be. If we can go in and find out where the maximums are here, then we could achieve much better averages. And as I said, average or mean gives you an expected indication, so what the average, uh, what the per users will see most of the time. Okay, so we know what metrics we want out, but what do we actually record? What kind of data point? And there's two things, really. We can record time, and by that I mean, you know, real-world clock-on-the-wall time, and that's typically done with a chrono time point. And that indicates what a typical user will experience. I'll go into what a typical user means in a bit, but essentially if we're measuring time on the wall, um, it's very environment dependent. So depending on what system you're running on, you'll get different um, time readings. There's another metric we can, or another um, time we can read, which is the CPU timestamp. And rather than measuring wall clock time, that measures clock cycles. And the other advantage of measuring this is that it's much less overhead to measure. It typically lives in a register on the CPU, so it's kind of effectively free to record. Um, I think in my benchmarks is about 100 times quicker than calling a chrono time point. And the other benefit we get here is that it's easier to compare between platforms. Um, I put that in quotes because obviously if you're running different CPUs, they might have different clock speeds. And if all other things stayed equal, then um, the time would be reduced on the CPU running at a higher clock rate, but the clock cycles would be the same, so you could compare those two. Usually, higher CPUs have different pipelines, different bus speeds, different caches, so they're not directly comparable. So we're going to look at um, some benchmarks throughout this talk. And the website I use for this mostly is called quickbench.com. Can I have a quick show of hands who uses QuickBench? Good, quite a lot of you. If you haven't, definitely check it out. It's kind of like Godbolt. Show of hands who uses Godbolt? Right, so it's just like that, um, apart from it wraps Google Benchmark. So the code looks like this. Um, and we're interested here in just benchmarking how long it takes to run a core high resolution clock now and the RDTSC function. And we can see the performance output that, yeah, RDTSC is about 100 times quicker. That's not to mean um, Chrono isn't useful. It certainly is because it gives you real world numbers. Um, but notice you might be measuring, particularly in micro benchmarks, the, perform, uh, the, the time taken to call uh, Chrono. So as I mentioned right at the beginning, we're building a system here so we can analyze performance over time. So um, we need to kind of figure out where we're going to actually measure our benchmarks, where we're going to run them, and where we're going to store the results. So ideally, we want stable environments. That gives us the kind of reproducibility I spoke about earlier. Um, and in a perfect world, you have a constant machine. I know in um, industries where this really matters, like finance, you might have a complete replica of the production machine that you can benchmark on so you know if you made changes, how it's affected the performance. In other industries where perhaps performance isn't so essential or you've got lower budgets, we can use cloud VMs to provide indicators. Um, cloud VMs are actually a lot better than you might think, um, and we'll see the kind of the results that you get out of that in a bit. So we're going to run benchmarks on a cloud VM, and then we need to store the results somewhere. Ideally, this is a cloud database because you can get access to it from lots of different places. And um, it's also easy to view the results. You can write a PHP wrapper around some SQL queries and then graph the data using some HTML and JavaScript. The bit I haven't got to is automatic notifications. I really think that um, the same way you can measure code coverage for GitHub pull requests, and if your code coverage goes down, you get a notification to say you should probably add some tests or something like that. It would be nice if you could get notified to say, you've made a change that your performance has decreased by 10%. You should probably look into this. Um, I think that would kind of help time-critical uh, code bases uh, not have regressions, basically. So if you put everything we've just spoken about together, we get this kind of three parts of our system. First of all, we measure our code. And the way I've built this is running on GitHub Actions. There's a few classes I'll quickly run over, um, but the code isn't super important here. It's the ideas. Then we get a load of metrics and results from our benchmarks. We push them up to a cloud database. And then back on GitHub, we use GitHub Pages 
to um, query a PHP wrapper that it also lives on the SQL, the same, the same server as, this, as the SQL database. And then we can use, I think it's called graph.js, the library, to view the results across time. So quick overview of the code. This is how we um, kind of measure the metrics. Um, quick overview of the code. It's very similar to Juice Performance Counter, but um, we get cycles out of this and also the variance. So all you essentially do is call start and stop around your performance sensitive bit of code, the bit you're benchmarking. And then when you're done, you can go get statistics and that will give you the mean, the maximum, the minimum, and the total in seconds and cycles. We kind of wrap this, um, or side by side goes a benchmark description. So this contains a category, name, description, and a platform that we use to kind of populate our database. And the other important thing here is the hash. That's essentially our unique identifier for our benchmark. And I called it hash because what I typically do is hash the description. And that's useful because if the description is meaningful, it says something like um, render 30 seconds of audio at 96 kilohertz with a buffer size of 512. If someone goes in and changes that benchmark and they update the description to change the buffer size, the hash will change and it will be considered a new benchmark, which is useful so you're not comparing different pieces of code. That gets combined with our metrics and a date, which is a timestamp for when the um, benchmark was run. And I just wrapped this in a nice class called Benchmark, where we kind of start, stop, um, pass it a description to construct it, and then get the results when we're done. Um, you can run these in any way you want, typically just an application that's run. I like to um, use the ju juice unit test, and I have a category called traction benchmarks, so I just have a test runner application where I run just the traction benchmarks category, and it will publish all these results directly to our server. Um, I probably won't go into this too much because you can't really see, but it's registered with a static instance. We can run a bunch of different resampling methods here. We've got Lagrange and three variants of sync interpolation. And then we set up our benchmark, use the scope benchmark helper to create it with our description. And then this is the bit of code that's just run. So this is a very macro level benchmark. We're just measuring effectively the total execution time because this is a 30 second sample rate conversion. So if we view the results on the website, excuse my web skills, I've meant for a long time to improve the look of this, but never got around to it. Um, but we can see the benchmarks run. Each one is a dot. And this is our kind of time axis. So we can spot um, trends in here. If we zoom in a bit, we can see that we can filter by category, name, uh, description, platform, change the start, end date for if we're interested in more detail. We can view it in time or cycles, show the various different metrics like total, min, max, variance, and also normalize the results. And that's important for something like this where we're making comparisons between different algorithms um, because it might show us a few things. Firstly, we can identify that there's no general regressions, so nothing we've done in that time has made performance worse, which is good. But also we might think if we want to pick a default for our code base for users, maybe the uh, fast or the medium are good choices because the, the quality is good and the performance is fairly stable and um, a lot less than the best quality. So when do we add benchmarks to our code base? That's a kind of similar question to when do we test? Well, there's several places. I like to think of benchmarks similar to unit tests. So when you write new code or new features, you would probably write tests for it. You should also write benchmarks. Um, there are other times when you get a QA or a user report if they're complaining something isn't performing as quickly as they expect or they're seeing beach balls. That's a good time to go in and add some benchmarks. And also, when you see regressions, if you have a very macro benchmark that suddenly starts taking a lot longer, you might want to go in and split out some components of that so you can get a better idea of where the performance issues are. OK, so on to the second section here. We're going to talk about some optimization techniques. Um, a small caveat, not all of these are exactly real-world examples, uh, sorry, real-time examples. Um, they are all real-world examples. Um, and that's mainly because real-time code often gets quite verbose with all the atomics, and I wanted to have examples that fitted nicely on a slide. But the ideas here are certainly applicable to all areas of code. 
So first, we need to identify um, which areas of code we need to optimize. And the way we do that is we can run a benchmark under a tool to get a better picture of what's going on. And there are a whole bunch of profiling tools. They vary in how much detail and kind of how close to the hardware the data they report is. So at the highest end, we have time profilers. These give you a tree of the time spent in each function in your application. Um, I'll show examples of these, so don't worry about trying to visualize it too much. And they can be used to identify hotspots, so where the most amount of your time is spent. And they come with all um, kind of major tools. Xcode Instruments has Time Profiler. There's a profile tool in Visual Studio. And if you're on Linux or indeed any platform, Intel VTune is available. A level down from that, we have system traces. And these typically show us events such as system calls, possibly memory management, thread interruptions, et cetera. And again, Xcode comes with system trace. And you can also use dtrace or strace on Linux. I'm not sure about Windows here. There's, there's probably something similar. And one level down from that, we have performance counters. These read CPU hardware registers for things like branch mispredictions, cache misses, and so on. So kind of really how the CPU is um, being utilized. And again, Xcode Instruments has counters. Linux comes with a tool called perf. And one important note here is when you're benchmarking, always profile your release builds. It's kind of pointless to profile debug builds because you'll be measuring things like assertions, your if debug sections, and the compiler just won't have optimized it. So you'll basically be wasting your time because the code could perform completely differently in a release build. So as I said, some examples. Um, here is an example of loading a traction engine project. I've kind of narrowed it down in time. And we can see that most of the time is spent creating MIDI clips. And half of the time spent creating MIDI clips is um, spent calling quantization type update type. So if this was a user reported problem, this would be a good place to start, because we know we can try and claw back up to 25% of our um, performance by optimizing this. Um, this isn't actually a real world example. Um, it's a kind of created, it was, it was a benchmark created to measure something else, which we'll see later on, and it will make sense why this is uh, highlighted here. Um, next, we have system trace. So rather than a tree here, we get a narrative of um, effectively system events. And if we zoom in in time a bit, we can see things a bit more clearly. So here we have a bunch of memory fills. Then we have our uh, virtual memory faults, which we can see that might be a problem if we're running in a real-time performance-sensitive section of code. We have thread states. So again, if you're expecting your algorithms to run uninterrupted on a thread, so you can kind of reason about how long they'll take, but something is interrupting them, here you can find out what thread is actually interrupting them and why. Uh, you can see here there's an interrupt handler being called. And also system calls. Um, here we have a bunch of file operations, which obviously you want to avoid in real-time code. So if you see any of these system calls, that's probably a, a red flag. And finally, on to performance counters. Um, there's a whole bunch that you can pick. I've chosen some cache misses. And uh, what's the other thing? Oh, yeah, mispredicted branches. So again, this is our benchmark running. You get the tree, so you can kind of see roughly what what's taking, uh, what's incrementing those counters. And the data looks a bit like this. So if we're interested in mispredicted branches, say you see lots of mispredicted branches, but you think your algorithm could be more straightforward, you could perhaps go in and try and reorganize it to train the branch predictor more or try and remove some branches. Next, we have cache misses. We have level one cache misses that you can see there's quite a few of, but that's not unexpected because level one cache is relatively small. Similar story with level two cache. Um, you'll see this doesn't happen too much at the beginning, but more towards the middle. And finally, level three cache. And again, we don't get any level three cache misses towards the start of this, but in the final third, we do. Um, and if you see a lot of level three cache misses, that's definitely something to look into. And the reason you're interested in cache misses is because your um, your CPU, if it wants to do an operation on some data, it needs to get that data. And if it lives in cache, 
it will be able to access it relatively quickly and higher up the cache all the way onto disk will take progressively longer to receive that data. So I've shown this animation before with the talk I gave with Fabian. Originally, I think Mike Acton gave it. I've seen Scott Myers give it. So credit to the people that originally created it. But it's a really good animation of um, to give you a feel of how long this stuff takes. So level one cache, pretty instant, just a few cycles. Level two cache, manageable, but still quite a bit longer. But RAM seems to take an absolute age. So if you end up with level two, if that's your highest cache, or level three, as most CPUs have now, missing, this is the price that you're paying. Whilst this is happening, your CPU is effectively just doing nothing. It's waiting for data. Um, it could be a bit more complicated than that, but certainly that's where most performance is lost these days. And all of this brings us nicely onto a question about cats. So this is one of my cats, Ico, and we're interested here in how do cats jump? So if we analyze the jump, we can see that it's all back legs. Okay, She just hops up into that shelf nicely. But we want to do some real science, so we can't just measure one cat. We have to measure two cats. So here's my other cat, Eric. Sorry for the dark cat on the dark windows, but hopefully you can make him out. You can see here he jumps completely with his back legs, and the front legs are just used for finding his landing. So there we have definitive proof that cats are rear-wheel drive. Um, hope that breaks up the monotony of the performance-sensitive <laughs> code a bit. You just all take a breath, because um, it gets more tricky. Um, OK, so now we're going to look at some techniques for optimization. So we've looked at the tools that we can run the benchmarks that we've created for. Now we're gonna, um, we found hotspots or areas like cache misses and things. So we need to figure out how we're gonna um, improve that code. And I go through um, some fairly standard techniques here. So the first one might sound obvious, but the simplest form of optimization is just to not do some work. So if we can identify these areas from our profile trace, um, we can just remove them or perhaps move them um, to a less performance sensitive area. There are other places this occurs as well, such as um, memory allocations. If you ever see memory allocations in your real time thread, you know you need to kind of remove them. But we can also combine memory allocations in non real time code by doing things like reserving. And you might also need to think of an alternative approach to the way you currently do things um, to remove a chunk of code from the performance sensitive area. So that includes things like evaluating lazily, we'll see an example of later on, and asynchronously. Asynchronously um, happens quite a lot in UI code where you can kind of just mark a load of things as um, needing to be updated, send a message, and then it, it will kind of call back and do those um, separately but still enabling you to um, receive mouse events and repaints and things. So back in QuickBench, I'll remove the QuickBench boilerplate because it's kind of just noise. We can see we have a vector of doubles that we're pushing 1,000 zeros into. So um, first of all, we're just going to do a straight pushback 1,000 times. Next, we're going to be a bit more intelligent and um, reserve the space. So we're going to reserve 1,000 and then push back 1,000 zeros. But we can also see if we're just creating a, a vector, rather than doing the pushback manually, we can just straight initialize it to zero. And you can see the relative performance gains here. So just by doing the reserve, you get an over sort of 2x performance. Um, second technique is identifying work that can be combined. So we can combine work in time. And this typically means either in parallel on multiple threads, um, using multiple threads for computing some kind of algorithm is uh, an interesting task because you often have to make the algorithm kind of worse um, to perform better on multiple threads. That might mean copying your data so it can be run completely concurrently, um, or it might mean that you use a less optimal algorithm so you can only work on part of it and then combine your work at the end. The other way of combining work in time is to use SIMD. So that stands for single instruction, multiple data. And if you're doing something like a multiply and add or um, um, any kind of mathematical operation, usually, rather than doing individual floats or doubles, you can work on a chunk of them um, at the same time. So you're getting kind of four, eight times the number of calculations with just a single instruction. 
The other way of combining work is with an algorithm. Um, if you imagine you're trying to plot an audio thumbnail, you've got some audio data, and you need to go through and read all the minimums, and then you need to read all the maximums, uh, the other way around, um, and then you can kind of plot a line between those to form your thumbnail. Um, rather than doing the pass twice, you obviously make sense to get the minimum and the maximum at the same time. And if we kind of uh, make a standard library version of that, we're effectively saying replacing std min element and a call to std max element with a call to min max element. I've got the kind of is approximately equal here because they actually return different iterators if you have multiple items that are the same. So just be aware that there's a few differences here. Um, quick note on SIMD. Fabian a few weeks ago wrote a really good post on the Juice forums about getting the compiler to auto-generate um, vector instructions for you. I won't go through all of it because it's detailed and you should read it. So here's the link. But in summary, he says, we need to build with at least O3 optimization. So these won't tend to kick in at lower optimization levels. We need to relax IEEE compliance with the F fast math flag. Um, and the reason for that is vector instructions um, aren't IEEE compliant. So they deal with denormals differently. They might deal with rounding to zero or other numbers slightly differently. They can um, deal with ints and nans differently, which don't usually affect us in audio, but it's worth noting that they you could get a different result to using non-vector code. So we need to tell the compiler it's OK to use these by relaxing IEEE compliance. And you can tend to get both of these with the OFAST flag. There is another um, tool you can use here. When the compiler generates vectorized code, it, uh, vector instructions typically only work on aligned data. So it has to kind of create a preamble or section, check whether the data is aligned or not, do the chunk on the unaligned data, and then process the rest using vector instructions and possibly some uh, kind of cleanup for empty sections at the end. But um, with the new std assume aligned, which I think Timor, I don't know if Timor's in the room, but I think he, you worked on this paper, didn't you? Yeah, with Chandler. So um, talk to him about this. But as far as I can gather, what it does is tells the compiler, don't generate that preamble section of code. Um, don't do any checks. Just assume it's all aligned so you can get some performance improvements there. Um, so here's an example of how we can speed up code using SIMD. This is just a simple benchmark that generates some random data, um, copies it, and then um, adds those numbers together uh, lots of times and benchmarks it. So that's the kind of bit that we're interested. And as you can see here, we've got about a four times improvement, which is typically what you would expect. If you have AVX, probably more, um, but certainly a three and a half times you can typically get. So definitely worth getting your compiler to do this for you because it's often just a few compiler flags. Um, and an example for the min-max element. So again, get rid of the um, boilerplate. We have just calls to min-max element and min-max element. And as you would expect, using GCC here and libstud C++, we get roughly a two times performance improvement. So that's, that's good news. And if we look at Clang with libstud C++, the same thing holds true. However, if you use libc++, which is the standard library that um, Clang produced, then things actually get worse when you use min-max element. And that's very counterintuitive, but highlights a couple of things. One, optimization is hard. Um, it's difficult to speculate what's happened here, but it could be that the um, algorithm has more branching, so the branch predictor can't train itself correctly, so it's having to kind of throw away lots of pipeline calculations. It could be that the instruction cache has got too full because the algorithm has got too large. Um, so there are reasons why this doesn't always hold true. And you should benchmark your code to check that you've made performances across all platforms. OK, third technique, reducing algorithmic complexity. And again, we look, use profilers for this. And we look for areas that take a long time so we can reduce the complexity of our algorithms. We typically reason about um, complexity in terms of big O notation. We have O1, which is constant time, where the time to compute the result doesn't, um, isn't determined by our data size. O log n, where as our data increases, the time um, take to compute 
um, decrease increases, but in smaller chunks. ON is a linear mapping, and then N squared and cubed are kind of more exponential changes. So when we're making changes to algorithms and all code um, in terms of optimization, we want to really make sure that they work the same way because it's very easy to mess things up. And the key thing here is that the contracts are the same. And of course, testing saves you time here. So if we take a look at an example in Traction Engine, every time a new um, edit item, which could be a track, a plugin, a clip, is created, we need to um, create an ID for it. This is just a, a number that we use as a handle to reference them. So we have some code that looks like this in the library. And the first thing you can see is there's a note to other developers to say, this might be slow. It's kind of annoying, because if you knew it was slow, why didn't you just make it faster? But it's also um, a good thing to do, because until we know this is slow, that we've actually benchmarked it and tested it, um, there's no point in kind of doing lots of optimizations. I did get a report to say this operation was slow when someone was copying and pasting hundreds of clips. So I took a look at it. And what the existing version does is goes through our state, which is a juice value tree, so essentially an XML structure, looks for um, any IDs that are ID, sorry, any properties that are ID declarations. So it has to recursively go through all of the properties and then convert them from typically a string that was passed from the file into a number. Then it has to do a bit more complicated things because if you're dragging stuff between tracks or copying, um, you might be living in this intermediate state where you're not actually in the model. So we need to make sure they don't conflict with that. Then we sort them all and go through it and find the first space and use that as an ID assign. So I looked at optimizing this, and there's a few different ways, but I essentially settled on this and thought, well, all we need to do is just increment a number and we'll get a new ID. Um, so I did that. I added a check and assertion to ensure that we were never generating the same IDs. And it works really well. Of course, we need to know where to start our count from. So the first time this is run, it does something similar. But rather than finding the first kind of free one, it goes to the end and then just goes off into the uh, future there. So if we look at the results of this, we can see before optimization, this, um, this copy and paste in about 50,000 clips. Uh, so it's hard work. But um, it was taking about 10 seconds to do. And then when I added this optimization, pretty close to zero. So that's about 100 times improvement. This is, um, that's a really good win. And if we zoom out in time, we can see that we haven't had any regressions. Um, if you zoom in just the last few months, you can see the noise I was talking about. This is typically what you get when you use VMs or non-dedicated machines, because things vary depending on what's running at that time. But we're still within um, sort of a, a few hundredths of a second, so that's pretty good still. And again, compared to the original time, no regressions. So what we've done here, if we analyze it, is we've reduced the complexity from roughly 0.2n to 0.1. So that's a constant time function now. But the behavior has changed in some fairly subtle ways, because the ID now always increases. It never goes back and finds those gaps. And it could wrap if uh, stood numeric, numeric limits in 64t max times is called. I know wrapping this is undefined behavior. It's actually uh, uint underneath and then casted. So it probably gets away with it. But that's probably not to worry, because that's 9 times 10 to the 18 clips, tracks, plugins, which is quite a lot. And actually, Timor said um, yesterday that if you use an unsigned 64, you could effectively create a 1,000 of these every, every microsecond for 300 years. So even with an int64t, we're still looking at 150 years worth of creating. Um, but the contract has stayed the same. So it still returns a unique identifier. That's the main thing. And this is checked with an assertion. OK, next technique, caching appropriate data. Um, if data is accessed in the same way frequently, um, it can be useful to store that manipulated data and just reuse it. This does introduce some difficulties. Um, we need to keep track of the cache and when it's dirty, so more variables to kind of muddy our classes. And we also need to know when to clean up the cache. 
So if we create a cache right at the beginning of an application and then it never gets used again, we need to kind of decide whether we should clear that cache because it's using memory. Because caching things does use additional memory, and we'll take a closer look at memory in a bit. Really simple example. Um, we cache our looped MIDI sequences because it helps us. Um, they're much quicker to seek into like this, and also it, um, it's quicker to figure out where no offs should be at the end of loop boundaries. So we have um, the way we do this is we store a unique pointer to our cache loop sequence, and any time a note is added or removed or moved in time, we just reset that pointer, and then only when we're interested in the loop sequence. We check if it's null and then create a cached version. Um, and this is an example of lazy evaluation that I spoke about earlier. OK, fifth and final technique, uh, we're going to look at uh, reducing memory. So as I said, cache misses effectively stall the CPU wasting cycles. So reducing the amount of memory a performance sensitive section of code uses can reduce the time to execute. Um, there's a few reasons for this. Firstly, is that memory is likely to be in lower cache levels. If it's using less memory, it's likely to fit in level three, level two, possibly level one cache. And as I said, lower cache levels are much, much faster, orders of magnitude faster. And the other way we can do this is to use contiguous memory. So if you have memory that's dotted about all over the place, because cache works in lines, if you try and read a byte of data, it will pull in typically 32 bytes around that in the cache. So if your data lives in lots of different places, you're constantly pulling in new cache lines and wasting the, the data that was cached around it. Um, if you use contiguous memory and your reads are predictable, then that data will probably already be cached for you by the time you come to read it. So there's some really good performance wins there. Um, we're going to take a slightly different approach looking at memory. We're going to um, investigate how it interacts with multi-threading and the interplays between the CPUs. So I don't know if anyone saw uh, my talk that was on the online version of um, edition of ADC a few years ago where I spoke about traction graph. I had a lot of these diagrams, um, and I'm going to kind of pick up where that left off. So we're going to start with this graph. Um, we're going to assume it's an audio graph with a bunch of nodes that needs processing. Uh, we're going to make a few assumptions here. Um, firstly, each node needs a chunk of memory to operate on. And each node is going to use the same size chunk of memory. So they could be mono buffers um, with a constant buffer size. We're also going to make another um, pre-optimization here, which is that C doesn't need any memory. It's just going to pass through the data that F has. So what we effectively get here is um, an additional dependency between F and A. So we need to assign some memory. The simplest way of doing this um, is just saying, right, each node is going to have its own chunk of memory. Remember, C doesn't need memory. So then we can hand this off to be processed. We know there's never going to be any conflicts because each node has its own um, chunk of memory. However, this probably isn't good for cache because we're using quite a lot of memory. So can we do better than this? Well, if we know we're only going to be processing using a single thread, we can do a sort of pre-processing analysis stage to try and assign buffers in the way that they can be reused. So if we go through this, we can assign a chunk uh, of memory to D, a chunk of memory to E, um, and then a chunk of memory to B. Because that has a dependency on D and E, it has to get a new chunk. But when B has finished processing, um, the dependencies to D and E have, are done with, so it can return those to the pool, ready to be reassigned to F. F gets processed, C gets processed, and then um, A gets processed. And we can see that we've reused chunks one and two here. So we've gone from using five chunks to three chunks of memory. So that's a 40% less amount of memory, which is likely to improve our cache performance. When um, we look at multi-threading, however, things are a little bit different. Uh, so yeah, those dependencies are gone now as well. So um, we have to kind of assume a worst case scenario when we're doing this pre-analysis um, memory assignment here. I've put the original um, 
kind of orientation of this on the side so you can kind of see the stages because it gets a bit complex with kind of three things happening at once. Uh, the uh, assignment algorithm effectively goes like this. We need to look at all the leaf nodes first and assign those a chunk of memory because they could all be processed at the same time, so we can't reuse any memory between them. Then the next tier up gets processed, um, and because B is being processed now, we don't have uh, chunks one and two from D and E to be processed. Um, C doesn't need memory, but B now takes chunk four because it does need some memory, and C is being processed, so we can't reuse the chunk from F. When we get to the top tier, um, we can see that D and E have been processed, which does return chunks one and two to the pool. So we can reuse um, chunk one here. Okay, so this is um, a kind of worst case scenario for this graph being processed with multiple threads. But we can still see that we've saved um, some memory compared to our most naive approach here. We've saved about 20%. The graph structure will change how useful this is, as we'll kind of look into in a minute. But there is another way to do memory assignment. So rather than doing it at kind of pre-analysis stage, we can do it at runtime. So imagine here we only have two threads, because we could have two threads processing our audio graphs. Um, if we take, if we have an order here, so each node is going to be processed, but with multiple threads, and only when a node is about to be processed, we request a chunk of memory, we get something that looks like this. So D and E are processed at the same time, um, and then B, they all need to be assigned some memory. But then these two threads could finish processing at effectively the same time and move on to queuing up processing to F and C. So because that happens, chunk one and two got returned to the pool and then reallocated to F, and then F gets, um, so the thread processing F finishes, and A can reuse chunk two. So if we do this at runtime, because it only happens when threads actually, or nodes, are being processed, so need a chunk of memory, we've actually saved a whole bunch of memory, and we've only used three chunks this time. Not the four we had in our kind of static analysis, and not the five if we just assigned every node some memory. So I hope that made sense. I know there's kind of a lot going on there. But also, I hope what's come across is multi-threaded assignment is difficult to reason about. That was a graph with six nodes, and it got quite complicated quite quickly. Um, and how much mileage you get out of this varies a lot. And the things that can vary are your graph size, so um, the number of nodes, but also the graph structure, how deep or how wide it is and also how many threads are being processed. And because there's all these kind of complex interplay of things, we really need to measure and benchmark. It's kind of our intuition often doesn't um, serve us well here. So I implemented uh, kind of the, the first and the last systems to, to test them um, because someone sent me this, uh, well, it was a traction edit um, project, but the graph structure looks like this. So this is what needs to be processed. But this is just a snapshot of it. If we zoom out to the whole thing, we can say this is what he actually sent me. And this is bonkers, because most projects are like 100, 200 nodes. This is about 900. Um, it was really a very kind of bus-heavy session. So in the naive approach, this um, where each node just has its own chunk of memory, this took you know, between four and seven seconds um, to process, and this is a 20-second export I was doing. And you can see the noise that you get here. This is typically what you see on uh, kind of non-dedicated machines with multiple threads running. It's a bit harder to know exactly how things are going to progress. So I added this um, um, runtime node assignment, and you can see the graph and go, oh, that looks better. If we look a bit closer, we can see that is where um, the previous example sits. So by doing this, we've actually made things worse in all scenarios. And what's happened here is the overhead of using less memory has outweighed the cache benefits. So there's a lot of mechanics involved in kind of going to the pool, getting some data, 
um, and then kind of freeing it and figuring out when you have these uh, pass-through chains what needs to be um, done. Um, so what we're saying is there's a lot of complexity in runtime assignment. But the metrics or the results might be different on more constrained platforms. Perhaps things are more easy to reason about. Um, or we have different graph configurations. If there are more nodes, perhaps larger channel counts, larger buffer sizes, um, we might have the leaf nodes are all stereo, but then they sum to some high order ambisonics at the top. That could pe perform completely differently. So what we've kind of figured out is we might need some heuristics of when to adapt the different strategies depending on the graph structure. And we can only really get that if we take an engineering approach to our performance. We have to measure, we have to measure continuously, and we have to analyze the data rather than making guesses about stuff. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, any questions? <laughs>